Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Ask a Professional Scrum Trainer webinar. I'm Lindsay Velasina with Scrum.org, and I will be our host today. And today we have a very fun edition of Ask a PST, and I have here three awesome PSTs. Um, I have Alex Bagidi, I have Ramal Frank, and I have Samuel Adesoga. So all these folks are primarily focused on doing business in Africa, and they're here to answer any of your Scrum questions that you have and also about the Scrum market in Africa. So uh, with that, let's kick this off. Really quick about scrum.org. Uh, we are the home of Scrum. We were founded by Ken Schwaber in 2009, and our mission is to help people and teams solve complex problems. We offer training and certification in professional Scrum, and we always encourage you to continue your ongoing learning. And we hope that today's session plays an important piece in that. And with that, I will hand it over to Frank to introduce himself. Hi, good morning to everyone. So I'm Frank, Gangmanye Romyal Frank uh, from Cameroon. So I'm happy to be with you today. I'm a senior Scrum Master and a, also a professional Scrum Trainer with Scrum.org uh, since few months. So uh, I'm running a company which is uh, Agile Thinking and our, our mission is to serve entrepreneurs, SMEs, and big companies in their agile journey. So that's all. Uh, feel free to reach out. Thanks. Okay, and Alex? Hi, everyone. My name is Alex Fagidi. I'm a PSD with Scrum.org, and uh, I've been a PSD for about a year now. I'm super happy to be here uh, to discuss Agile and Scrum with you. Um, we have a community called Agile Africa, where you can uh, join it at agileafrica.net uh, to learn from um, agilists from all over the world, not just Africa. And I'm happy to have started a company now uh, in Senegal, uh, trying to uh, raise awareness about agile digital transformation and all these uh, new ways of working uh, on the continent. So happy to be here. Uh, let's learn together. And pass it on to Samuel. Go ahead, Samuel. Oh, hi, everyone. Um, so Sam, an Agile coach and a trainer with Scrum.org. So I've been around Scrum since 2007. I've worked as a developer, QA, test manager, Scrum master, supporting organizations to use Scrum and other Agile frameworks to deliver value to their customers. Um, at the moment, I am the principal coach and lead trainer at Valley Hot Limited. Um, an agile consultancy that supports organization at different levels from executive to team level, helping them to solve business challenges using agile ways of working. In 2022, I am committed to train and mentor a minimum of 100 individuals in Africa on Scrum. And I think I'm about on 65. So I'm pretty excited about that. And I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Fantastic. So I would like to invite everyone to please enter all of your questions into our Q&A. And I'm going to stop sharing. And let's get started with a question here. So we're going to start with you, Samuel. Um, what's the difference between Agile and Scrum? What, so the question is, what's the difference between Agile and Scrum? Yes. So I like to refer to Agile as a mindset, um, which is required by organizations in the complex world that we are today. And it's really about learning by learning from experimentation. It's, um, and then and Scrum is a framework based on Agile principles. There are many other frameworks out there, but Scrum is just a framework um, within that agile space. Perfect. Thank you for that explanation. And there is a question and comment that came in from Louise here in the chat. Um, our teams believe in the principle, you build it, you own it, which means that bugs that impact production environments are raised and added mid sprint. I need help in navigating how to deal with bugs 
from whether they should be estimated with story points or how to track the number of bugs, how to report the impact on team velocity, all that suggestions appreciated. So it sounds like this could spark a good discussion around measurement. <laughs> so Alex, I'm gonna kick this one over to you. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one about, um, you know, what really matters and what you really want to measure. So if I understand well the question, uh, this is about estimating and how to track the number of bugs and report the impact on team velocity. Um, you know what? First, ask yourself, what do you want to measure? What really matters? What are you building? You're saying that you build it, you own it. So what's your product? Uh, does it really matter for you to measure just the bugs and count the number of bugs? What are your customers receiving at the end? Um, it, does it really matter to them to know how many bugs you fixed? So uh, if you want to put more effort into tracking your velocity, number of bugs, and if that's what it matters for management, I understand. Oh, so for the context coming in, uh, bugs are a hot topic. Okay, okay, great. So I would say, first of all, um, I would focus more on the value delivery uh, than on tracking the bugs. That, was, that would be my input to start with. Um, if you have challenges with their quality, I would look into your definition of done. Figure out, are you really building quality from the get-go? Are you really focusing on uh, creating a product that is usable and shippable to your users? Uh, if that's not the case, maybe look into your definition of done. Look at what you're creating and how, how are you uh, building those products quality-wise. Um, yeah, I would start with that. Uh, maybe I'm going to pass it on to my fellow PSTs if they want to add anything else. There are more stuff we can discuss about that, but go ahead. Maybe Sam or Frank. Um, can I just add to that? Sure. Um, so I had an experience a long time ago where, and what we did was we never estimated bugs because the PBI, which is the story, has been estimated for, and that's where the value is. So as much as possible, the Scrum team wants to try to fix all the bugs within the sprint, right? And if, as Alex said, if there are bugs being found in production, then we need to look at other things. Why are there so many bugs? But historically, in that team, we never estimated bugs. We just focus on estimating stories, you know? And ultimately, you know, that would drop maybe the velocity, it doesn't matter really because you need to, that means there's a problem you need to fix. You shouldn't have so many bugs in your product. I hope that helps, um, Luis. Thanks, Sam. I don't know if uh, Romeo also wanted to add something on this or not. Uh, no, I think uh, your answer was quite good. Uh, really interesting. It depends on the team, what they want to measure. Uh, one thing that I found useful was to use this concept from upper, from the 10 to three and three to one, maybe uh, by measuring the number of bugs you have, maybe not, maybe not only estimating them because sometimes it's like a mess when you try to estimate bugs, but counting the number of bugs you have in, maybe in production, may be helpful if you can see in, in time, with time, let us say like you, you are going from 10 bugs per sprint to three and so on to try to maybe emphasize on your definition of done or on your test to reduce that, uh, those bugs. Thanks, Frank. But, uh, uh, if yeah, I, in general, it's good. I may add real quick, uh, I would also ask the client, because I'm looking at the question from um, Louise, ask the client, why does the client want to track so much the bugs? What's the reason behind it? Because tracking bugs, is that's, a, that's an output metric. So you, you, you're seeing how many bugs, so that gives you an indicator of the quality of the code, maybe, or, or the way you're building the product. So and maybe based on that indicator, you can adjust your ways of working and your way of developing. So yeah, bugs are opposite of quality. I agree. Yeah. So yeah, I hope uh, we all gave you some indication and some uh, some uh, some ways you can face this uh, this challenge. No problem, Liz. Thank you. Um, this next question, somewhat yeah. related. Um, I'll throw this one at you, Frank. Uh, <laughs> what is the best way to implement story points? And she said in Africa specifically, it's from Vivian. <laughs> Maybe I will ask, what is the context? What is the particularity of Africa for, for estimating? Uh, I know that we are maybe better in approximation, trying to estimate 
really estimating because uh, when we talk about estimating, we don't want to have the precise value, but we want to approach something. And I think we are quite good in that in Africa because we are not we are not too much close to having the exact the exact value. So one thing I I really appreciate to use is um, relative estimation. Uh, for example, uh, we can it's up to the team to to decide. Uh, what they want to choose, but they can use the, this Fibonacci suite numbers that, that works fine for most of the team I work with, but it also depends on you. I don't know if you have something in mind particularly, but this can be a good starting point. Use that uh, Fibonacci suite value from one, two, three, five, and so on. And maybe just avoid to get stuck on estimating. Uh, uh, just It's just about estimation. So uh, it's to have something we can work on open on to continue to improve. Uh, if you have maybe more context, uh, I don't know if someone else has something to to share. Yes, Alex, maybe. Alex, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, funny st funny thing is uh, in the Scrum Guide, the word estimation is not in there. We, we, we talk about sizing. But that being said, uh, you have the absolute estimation when you're just trying to guess as much as you can on uh, how you, like the, the time is gonna take or the effort is gonna take to build your product versus the relative estimation that uh, our friend uh, Romeo Frank was mentioning. So you have other alternative than just story pointing, uh, story sizing, you have t-shirt sizing, you have many other techniques available, but remember something, remember this, um, the time you spend on estimating or sizing your PBIs is time you are not spending building the product. So ask yourself what type of effort you wanna be spending estimating future work versus working on your actual solution. That's all I wanted to add. Great, thank you. Okay, so this next question from Teodora, I am going to throw this question at you, Sam. How, do you, how does Scrum help with handling technical debt? Right, thank you very much. So, Technical debt, um, <clears throat> let me try and define what that is just for everyone, to help everyone. Technical debt um, are outcomes or result of decisions that we take either consciously or unconsciously, almost taking a shortcut. And this happens when maybe management pushing the team, not focus on quality, you want to get stuff done, then you compromise on quality. And that's what technical debt is. And most products would have some element of technical debt. And the Scrum approach really is for the Scrum master to support the team to fix those technical debts, at least a certain percentage every single sprint. The truth is, and I've seen this so many times, if you don't fix a technical debt, it will come back to hurt you. Someday, the Scrum team will be grinded. Nothing can be delivered. So what you want to do, obviously, is to deliver value every single sprint. But at the same time, reserve a certain percentage of your sprint, which can be discussed among the Scrum team, and start repaying this technical debt back, you know, and ensure that you are fixing those um, issues in your, in your product. Also, technical debt should be part of your product backlog so that it's transparent and your product owner and stakeholders know about this. I hope that helps. Thanks, Sam. I, I if, if, if you have time, I want to add something uh, for on it. top of this. Yeah, an example, uh, in my company actually, in a banking company, uh, we have this item on the, the deployment pipeline, so conscious integration and conscious deployment, uh, that maybe some of us may know here, which is Jenkins. And for six to eight months, we had an issue with Jenkins that developers reported to, to managers to help to find a solution that, that was not fixed yet. And it was really an impediment. When I mean impediment, I want to say that, in fact, sometimes we had to wait for four hours or even two days to have a deployment to go from the starting to the end of the pipeline. And when I uh, came into that team, developers were really, you know, uh, with time, we become you became a cynic, so you don't believe in more in the in your managers. So you really have to fix technical debt because sometimes it may impact negatively the morale of your team. So it's really an important subject here. 
And what we did is was to prioritize this impediment fixing for the first two sprints of this quarter, the, the last quarter, so that actually we're able to deliver in less than a minute, creating our own pipeline, our own server. So you really need to have to pay attention to technical debt. But as Sam Sam uh, told early, try to see how to maybe deliver value by fixing technical debt at the same time. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, this next question, I'm going to throw it at you, Alex. What are key characteristics of a product backlog? Well, so uh, in your the product backlog is essentially a, what I call a living artifact, it's a living organism. It's never going to be complete. So it's the story of your product. In your product backlog, you'll have product backlog items, so elements that are going to be some are going to be really detailed and ready to be worked on, and some are going to be more vague. And you're going to, you know, you have an idea, have something you want to add to your product, and uh, you need re re need refinement, need some uh, more um, work and details on. So uh, what you have in your product backlog is a mix of all these things, some really detailed and precise, and some more vague. Um, that product backlog is owned by the product owner, uh, who is going to be managing it and making sure that uh, the order of the PBIs uh, will help your teams work on the most valuable PBIs. And uh, yeah, I would say that your product backlog is really uh, an important artifact if you're working on a, on a product, a complex product. So if you have any other question about the product backlog um, or any other elements my fellow PSTs would like to add, feel free can to I, do so. Can I just add one more to that? Sure. Um, Go for it, I'm not sure you mentioned that. I think the product mm -hmm. goal as well ah, is something that we want in there. Yeah. We want to ensure that the product goal is there so that every single PBI in your product backlog would then emerge to deliver that product goal. So that's something that's very important. Absolutely. Good point, Samuel. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Right, thanks. So this next question comes in from Kamal. I've been in an internship where they started to use Scrum in a poor way. And this is because the management wants the teams to deliver quickly, pushing them to work in their standard ways. How as a scrum master, can I value scrum in my team when the management does not help? So I'm going to throw this at you, Frank. A difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> you all can chime in and work on it together. You got, you got this, Frank. You got this. You got this. Uh, we'll help you. So to precise the context, so uh, we are in a situation where we have a we have managers that want the team to deliver quickly, pushing them to work in their standard ways. And the question is, how us a scrum master can uh, can I value Scrum in my team when the management doesn't help? Yep, a, a difficult situation. And that many bad consequences. Uh, really interesting question. I think the first thing maybe is to, to clarify with managers. Maybe not the first thing, but one thing that can help is to clarify with managers what they want to achieve. Uh, the question is, do they want to deliver quickly or they want um, an environment where we can sustainably deliver value and increase sprint after sprint. I, need, I think you need to clarify this question with managers first and that may help also managers by creating transparency to them to help them understand what is Scrum and what is not Scrum. Because for some people, delivering quickly is Scrum. And the consequences are, or one of the consequences is that the developers and even the company may finally end up by thinking that Scrum or Agile just mean a mess of work, working too much, working too hard. So maybe creating transparency, creating transparency by clarifying this point may be helpful. That would be my, my first action. I don't know if you want to add something. Um, let me, can I just chime in there? Um... 
I think yeah. in this example, and this, are, and this is a situation that I've seen a lot because almost every team starts from here. They have a conception that once we're agile, we're going to go quickly. So one of the first things I do as a scrum master or an agile coach is to help establish what value is. What is value? And, and why we should care about value, okay? Then also helping the organization management to understand how they need to support. There's a lot of work for a scrum master to help them understand what sort of support, you know, the scrum team needs from them. And also, so the, the, pushing the teams to deliver quickly. And that's another thing we need to understand. What are the pressures on management and really offer as a scrum master to serve them, to help them get out whatever the priorities are per time. Have you got a product goal? Have you got your sprint goals? And that's what we should be focusing on. Oftentimes when I see management getting involved in scrum, it's because the scrum team isn't delivering. And so maybe there's some work as well for the scrum master to work with the scrum, scrum team to understand are we delivering on our sprint goals every week? And that would be some initial thoughts on how to approach this. Alex, do you want to go next? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm hoping that really helps. I mean, that, would be, that would be where to start from. I feel like there is a lack of an understanding of what scrum really is, as um, Frank said earlier. So helping the Scrum team and the organization to really realign on Scrum and the Scrum principles would be a good place to start. And then look at the commitments. Have we got a product goal? Have we got a um, sprint goal for every single sprint? And really get everyone to focus back on those and support the Scrum team to start delivering on those sprint goals. That would be a good way to start. And pay attention to, to what what you want to create uh, as environment, because uh, if the team is new to Agile or to Scrum, they may think that Agile means only working like a mess. And this is something that we we have seen so much. Are we, are we still on the question of, I'm oh, sorry. Are we still on the question about yes, management? I, uh, yes, yes. Okay, yeah, I was just gonna say that um, maybe we can share with management what's pre preventing us to go quickly or as fast as they want uh, and try to make it transparent, make that problem transparent. Uh, the Scrum Master have a role to play at the Scrum team level, the PO level, and also in the organization. So uh, I think a great Scrum Master will be careful uh, also bringing that change, bringing those new ways of working to management because sometimes management is not aware of what Agile and Scrum is really about. So it has to be a progressive and step-by-step and -step process to bring management into knowing really what Agile and Scrum is about. Uh, so yes, Scrum Masters out there, uh, yes, be there for the organization, be careful uh, and be open to uh, listening to what management has to say and try to understand the why behind the behavior of management and why they're asking for speed, speed, speed. Is just speed that matters to them or it's also quality of what you're building that's gonna be important? That's what I wanted to add. Great, thank you. All right, so I hope this answered that tough question. Um, this next <laughs> one is another one that I think all three of you will probably chime in on. Um, we'll start with Sam and then we'll let you both chime in here. So this comes in from Rachel. Um, hi, I'm Rachel. I'm Rwandan and new to Scrum. I recently did pass the PSM one exam. Congrats. Um, and this, at this point, it's hard to gain hands-on experience as it would require me to land a job, which is hard as they ask for experience. So what she's really asking here, so how can she gain some experience um, and what are some communities in that support new scr folks new to Scrum in Africa? Right. Okay. Um, thank you, Rachel. And again, congratulations for passing um, the PSM examination. So this is a question that I get a lot. And I have supported a lot of people that are trying to transition into um, um, Scrum, to being a Scrum master, right? So you've passed um, a PSM1 assessment, and I, I'm not sure if you've been in a class or not, 
So one of the things I would always ask is try and attend a class because in a classroom, there's so many advantages. You know, you are meeting other professionals, sharing their experiences, you are networking, and it's just an immersive 16 hours. I'm not trying to sell the class here now, but I think it is really valuable to be in a class. And the next thing I would advise is reach out to the startup community in your country, even online, and um, volunteer your time. Be transparent with them. I'm a new PSM one. I've just passed my P. I'm interested in Scrum. Let me write up a cover letter why you believe in Scrum, why you love Scrum, and how you want to help them. You will get a job. You might not get paid for that, but that will give you um, some experience. The next thing I would advise you is look into your community. How can you help? I've, there was a guy that took a PSM1 class with me. He's a music producer. And I told him, you've got a team already. Work with them and implement the elements of Scrum in your music production company. Put in the sprint retrospective, put in the sprint reviews, do the sprint planning, do your daily Scrums. That way you are practicing Scrum without even working in a software development team or a product team. So those will be some ways to get that experience. I hope that helps, Rachel. Okay. Any other advice from Romald or Alex on that one? Just want to emphasize the fact that you we are talking about Scrum. So we are talking about empiricism. So start with what you have. So I really appreciate the, the last point of Alex. Start with what you have uh, of Samuel, sorry. So start implementing Scrum where you are. And I, I think I think I think Sam uh, Sam Sam really uh, threw it out of the park here. Um, look look around you and see what you can do. Scrum is not just about software and IT. I think you can use uh, agile ways of working and and, and, and Scrum in a few complex issues. Um, I was watching a movie called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. I'm going to put the the link if you guys want to look into this one. Uh, it's uh, something happening in Africa. It's a true story that happened a few years ago in Malawi. And, and that boy uh, used agile ways of working to create a solution to help save his uh, village. So just an example right, of things you can do. Look around you and see how uh, what you've learned as a PSM1 can help, uh, help people around you. Um, and reach out. Reach out to the community. Reach out to people who are um, in that industry, in uh, in that field, product management, Scrum. Uh, we are on LinkedIn. You can uh, you can look at uh, look us up, and maybe we can help each other. But your problem is really common. A lot of uh, new uh, certified Scrum masters, uh, professional Scrum masters online are wondering how am I going to practice this knowledge that I have now. So uh, you're not alone. All I wanted to add. Fantastic. Thank you. And there's also um, a Scrum Master Learning Path on the ah. scrum.org web, website. So please be sure to check that out as a resource as well. So this next question, have, I'll give this one to you, Alex. Have you ever practiced 100% agile? I know most companies combine waterfall and agile in some percentage, but is 100% agile possible? <laughs> Million <laughs> dollar you. question. Thanks, Lindsay. Appreciate You're it. <laughs> funny, funny thing is, I I, I have the, the opportunity to work with a lot of project managers because I'm I'm a trainer with Scrum.org and I'm also helping with project management community with PMI and and I have this question a lot. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a common one. I would say uh, I, I'm I'm careful when it's about the extremes, like right? the full on waterfall or the full on agile. I believe more into having a great toolbox, a versatile toolbox. Uh, having waterfall and agile instead of one or the other. Uh, I see more value in having both in your toolbox uh, than going full on uh, on one side. That being said, um, I think context counts. Um, it, based on your context, maybe pure agile would work. Now the question is, what does pure agile mean in your context? Does it mean you're really uh, respecting the Scrum Guide if you're using Scrum as an agile practice? Is it that you're using Scrum by the book and you're applying everything by the book, which, by the way, I haven't seen in like seven years doing Scrum. I've never seen that in any organization uh, because there are many things to put in place before you do like the perfect Scrum, quote unquote. 
So I would say, uh, be careful with the extremes. Uh, do what you can, uh, respect the framework, put in place the values, principles, and make sure that first you put people uh, in the center of this this change and this adoption. I'm sure I can see Sam is like eager to add something. So Sam, go for it. <laughs> well, I think I'm, uh, I think you answered well, Alex. Um, I don't think there's anything as such as unrepresented agile. There isn't a destination, but there is a journey, and it's a a journey of continuous learning and improving your processes. It's about improving your ways of working. And oftentimes I've seen different examples. You start from a small team, then maybe a, an entire business line is you know, much more agile than other parts of the area. Sometimes it's finance that is still very slow, yearly budgeting. So I think the point really is, I, I don't think there is that place of an 100% agility. I don't think that exists. It's a continuous journey. You keep learning taking the principles and the basics really you've got the agile manifesto the agile principles start from that what does that really mean in your organization take a framework such as chrome and start implementing that and then doing your retrospectives reviewing that over time and just get better at improving ways of working keeping your employees happy you know, delivering value for your stakeholders in a way that is safe people is a happy workplace those for me are the goals and then eventually maybe there is a destination but i think for me it is just a process of learning and improving our ways of working great thank you that was really good advice so this next question are product backlog refinement meetings in the scrum team important and what frequency do you recommend i'll give this one to you ramal <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. I think the the idea behind the question is also to recognize that uh, maybe it's not mentioned in the Scrum Guide as an as an event. Uh, this is good, and so uh, the idea behind that is also that it depends on the team on the context once more. So uh, for sure, for the backlog refinement is useful. At least in my context, it's really useful uh, but you have to see in your own context with your team with the product you are building the level of knowledge you have on the product the level of knowledge you on how you want to prepare your product backlog items so that your spring planning may be smooth so slowly and uh, fluent and also achieve the purpose for the team uh, let me share uh, my experience here what I saw with my team actually is that when we don't have the product backlog refinement, we are a bit stuck during the sprint plan. And sometimes we have a lot of items that are not uh, discussed or reviewed during the planning. But when we have the, the, the product backlog refinement before, one or two sessions, it depends on the sprints, we are able to have a good sprint backlog, a, a, a good sprint planning that help us achieve, uh, define at least our sprint goal, uh, understand or discuss the product backlog items, review them and set up a sprint backlog. So it really depends on your context. Uh, in my context, we have two, uh, we have a sprint of two weeks and we have a, a sprint backlog refinement plan on our agenda, but it depends from sprint to sprint if you have one or two sessions. So uh, it's really context dependent, but sure they are, they are important and valuable. So the frequency, it's really up to you. Try something, maybe one follow back refinement event, see the value that you have from this event and try to adjust. Great, I hope thank you. I hope will help you. <laughs> Awesome. Um, that seemed like a good answer. If you need more clarification, feel free to type into the Q&A. Uh, this next question. So how can you get experience as a scrum master when companies in your nation don't do scrum? So I'll give this one to you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, how can you, I mean, 
So I think the first thing you've done is you've gained some knowledge as an individual, you understand Scrum. Start by sharing the knowledge you have with your peers, your friends, right? And even though you say the companies in your nation don't do Scrum, maybe you don't know about it. Scrum is pretty popular now. I mean, in Nigeria right now, yeah? And increasingly we are seeing job adverts for Scrum masters. You know, so maybe you can be that person to lead the way, have conversations, set up a working group, you know, and even if you want to, you know, reach out, reach out to someone like myself, I'm happy to come and discuss and see how we can get that conversation going in your nation. But how can you get that explained also? That, that's, that's one aspect. So you start that out. You be that person to share what you know and start a local community and share knowledge, reach out to someone like myself. The other thing as well is look online. I don't know what country you are from, but I'm pretty sure in Africa, I've heard about Scrum Masters in Kenya, I've heard about Scrum Masters in Ghana, in Nigeria. It's get, we're gonna get more and more Scrum Masters in Africa. So reach out to other countries, send reach out on LinkedIn. It's a good networking tool and say, I, I want to work as a Scrum Master. I want some. Oh, we lost your sound there, we, Sam. We lost your audio, Sam. Oops, what else? You? And you were in the middle of a really good thought. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I don't go. know what you know. Oh, God, <laughs> sorry. Tech, sorry, tech. So, really, so startups, really, see, I love saying this because startups don't have enough budget. They would really bring you on board to support them and practice. Use them as your learning bed and show them what Scrum can do. I hope that helps. Hey, I think you forgot one thing. Alex, maybe, you maybe, something to add? Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, a joke between Sam and I. Maybe you can send all your resumes to Sam because he's probably hiring right now. Everybody who needs experience. Yeah, bring that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Sam, I've been doing a great job mentoring and supporting uh, uh, Scrum Masters and Agilists on the continent. So uh, great ideas there, you know, the user group. Um, local clinics, local webinars, local uh, workshops. Um, you can start with that to kind of see, you know, pick the interest of people who might be uh, starting with Scrum and Agile like you, blogging also online about Scrum, even if you're just starting, sharing that passion with the rest of the world can be an interesting way to be exposed and put yourself out there as someone who, um, who knows what Scrum is. So, good for thoughts. That's some really great advice there. Um, so this next one, I'll give this one to you, Alex. Uh, what do you think are the main implications of projects where the Scrum Master also acts as the PO? Uh-oh. Oh, oh. Yeah. Huh. okay. In, in, in other words, how can you be <laughs> two places at the same time or wear, wearing two hats at the same time? Uh, I see a lot of risks doing that, being a Scrum Master and a product owner. By the way, the Scrum guy doesn't say anything about that, doesn't say that it's you shouldn't, but I would not recommend that, to be honest, um, because um, two accountabilities, uh, being a Scrum Master involves supporting the Scrum team, the product owner, uh, the organization. Uh, sometimes as a Scrum Master, you're going to be supporting many teams, two, three, even four, four teams sometimes. If you have to do that and also take care of the backlog, take care of uh, setting up the goals uh, or, or, or helping the team, the developers, you're going to burn yourself. Right? I would not recommend uh, doing that. I, I did it uh, in, in a previous life. Not a good idea. Um, I would say, but I just want to just want to say this. Sometimes you have to. Let's say, in in your context, uh, you don't have a PO or it's a startup, and you're the owner, and you have to act as a scrum master and the product owner for a short period. It might be okay. I'm saying it might be okay for a short period to kind of have those while you're looking for someone to act as the full-time Scrum Master or the full-time product owner. Uh, but once again, I would not recommend wearing both hats at the same time. It's too much work. I, I, I won't even mention the task switching and the context switching involved when you're having both hats. Um, yeah, so please, if you, if you can, just don't do it. Sam or Frank, want to add something? No, I think, well, I think you said it all, to be honest. I'm not going to add to that. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to leave this one up for grabs of which one of you wants to answer this one, but have any of you used Scrum in marketing and can you give some pointers on managing it? So um, 
I haven't used Chrome in marketing, but what I did recently was use Chrome with a group of company secretaries, right? Okay. They plan events. So for me, I think with marketing, what you need to un what you need to probably do is, of course, you, you need the accountability. It's a Scrum Master, a PO, and you need the developers, everyone contributing to the work being done. I think what you need to probably do is to figure out what is your product, okay? And I've spoken to a few people in the past where it's a marketing company agency and every single project that they, they have on was what the product is, right? So to be very clear on what the product is and then working together to define the product goal. And then you start defining your PBIs that deliver that product goal. That could be a way to do it. And then start having conversations about how might you break down the work that needs to be done to deliver um, the PBIs and then you start planning your work in sprints. So for me, you have to think about, I think the bigger challenge is what are we delivering here? What is the service we are delivering? Once you can, once you can um, understand what the product is, then start with layering on top the elements of Scrum and learn from that experience and you know keep improving that way and i'm happy to discuss this um offline if anyone wants to do that but i think that would be what i found is the difficult thing is what is our product because sometimes you're doing so many things and you have to probably have to differentiate what the product is and what isn't and not every aspect of your organization might be suitable for scrum so oftentimes you put everything into one bucket saying scrum for the entire company no figure out what the product is and practice Chrome around that. And as you develop your understanding, you can then expand to other areas of the organization. Great. Thank you for that answer. Um, I hope that helps. Um, this next question is specific to culture in Africa. Um, so as a practicing Scrum Master, I've come to notice that Scrum is in total contradiction with the organizational culture, which is command and control in most African organizations. How do you practice Scrum and manage this conflict? So I'll, I'll let you start with this one, Ramald, and then if, the, if you both want to chime in, go for it. Okay. <clears throat> uh, surprisingly, maybe I will share uh, acts an effort for us as Scrum Masters in maybe in Africa uh, to stop thinking that this command, uh, command and control systems or system is only in Africa. We have seen it too much time also in Europe where we have also managers that want to, to know at which level you are every time asking questions during all the journey. So all the day, so it's not really specific to Africa. Sometimes we think it is, but it's not. So let us stop thinking like this and try to discover opportunities or solutions to try to overcome this, this issue. So it's mainly the, the, the job of the Scrum Master is to really to try, be creative, try to find solutions. How can I convince these people change? We are discussing about change management. So be patient and try to create transparency to help people on the. Oh. Well, lost remote. Okay, it's back. You're muted. You're muted. Okay, I'm sorry. Is it good okay. now? Okay, we're good yes. now. Okay. Give me that thought. <laughs> okay, so okay, first point, stop thinking it's only the problem of Africa. And secondly, try to review how we can create transparency for managers to see themselves, how they're impeding their team performance. Applying these two points, maybe you'll be able to identify solutions. Mm -hmm. I will let my others complete maybe this point. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I would go a little bit on that. I think, so I'll, I'll start from an experience, right? Years and years and years ago, I was a Scrum Master and I thought we could do Scrum successfully 
without involving management? No, that would lead to a lot of frustration, okay? So what we need to do as Scrum practitioners, um, Scrum masters, agile coaches is to bring the management along on this journey. So usually I spend a lot of my time in conversations with management, the line managers, for them to really understand agility. Why is it important? Why is Scrum important? And what does the Scrum team expect of them? So that's very important. And that would help any Scrum implementation in the organization. So I personally, once I start working on the Scrum team, helping the Scrum team to be a bit more self-managing, I focus a lot of my attention on the immediate management around the Scrum team and bring them along. Get them invited to the Scrum, to the sprint review so they know what's going on. What I say is oftentimes when managers are micromanaging, there's a lack of trust. And one of the ways I've found in my experience to build trust is to deliver. So we work with management. I've never had anyone argue with me on value. Value is always important. What's, why are we doing what we do? And once the Scrum team can show you progress towards that value, incrementally delivering value, people tend to want to be along on that journey, right? So for me, invite them to as many events that they require, like the sprint review is a good one. And then either as a Scrum master or an agile coach, actively work with management. Start by the maybe the allies you've got and start working your way up until you have majority of them along with you on that journey. Alex, I think you had something. Um, yeah, uh, if I may add real quick. Um, in, in these situations, and I, I totally agree with what you said, Frank, um, the command and control thing is not an African thing. It's a worldwide thing. Um, and, and in this situation, I, I like to ask uh, to the management, to the decision makers, because they have a key role to, to, to play here, like Sam was mentioning. If decision makers don't want to try Scrum, you're going to have a hard time as a Scrum master, as an agile practitioner to put in place those new ways of working. It's going to be tough for you. So showing results is one thing. Experimenting, getting them to, to that point of openness to trying even uh, agile and Scrum is a first step. Uh, then uh, try to identify a problem that maybe they want you to tackle, a complex problem, complex product they would like you to tackle to kind of prove, to act as a, as a showcase, uh, a use case that you can use to, to say, okay, we're going to show you that Scrum can work in this situation. Uh, I tried that in the past where one of my stakeholders wanted to spend uh, about a million dollars on a new feature that they wanted to add on a banking platform. And they were like so sure that this new product would work. And using an agile approach, I said, hey, you know what? You want to invest $1 million? Maybe if you give me $20,000, let me show you and validate that this assumption is really, really what you think about. So we tried. We just added a link on the platform without nothing in the back. The link was just pointing to a page saying, this new feature is coming soon. And we tried that for, let's say, two months, just to see if people will, will, will come, in, come and, and, and click on that link. And trust me, we had like five clicks in two months. So that just showed that, hey, you experimented and you see that the, the value is not there. There is no interest. So we reduced the risk. So instead of spending a million dollars, we spent 20,000 to validate an assumption. That's just an example of you know, adopting agile approaches, like how it can save you money, how it can reduce the risk on your products, for example. So yeah, that would be my input. Awesome, thank you both. So this, we have time for one to two more questions here. And whichever questions we don't get to, just so the audience knows, I'm going to be sharing the list of questions with our panel here, and they will get back to you directly with answers to those questions. So don't worry about that. They will get answered at some point in time, if not on today's session. So this next question here, I'll give this one to you, Alex. What is your take on smaller teams perform better? The smaller the team, the better. Do we want to talk a little bit on team size? Hmm. All right. So let's start by saying that the Scrum Guide would tell you um, that uh, the ideal Scrum team would be 10 people or less. Uh, that being said, um, smaller teams would give you less perspectives. So if you have 
let's say three people in your team, that's, that's a nice size, you know, their implication on also the communication channel. So the more people you have in your team, the more complex it's gonna to be to communicate and align and share information within the team. So if your small team have all the skills you need to create a great product, that's great, go for it. If you have, yes, a small team, but you need people, you need to add more or to hire more to be able to create an increment after each sprint, you, start, you gotta ask yourself the three questions. So I, I think beyond the size, it's about, okay, what can that small team do? Is that small team able to actually uh, create that value? Like my friend Sam is always mentioning. Um, yeah, that's really the question I would, I would ask more. So people, Sam, Frank, yeah, can, I, can I add very quickly Please. on that as well? Go so there it, is man. a lot of work on research on team size. And in my 17 years of being working in Agile, and one thing we learned is that one of the biggest one of the biggest reasons why projects fail is lack of communication, misunderstanding, and that's why it's no surprise that in Scrum we talk about transparency as shared understanding. So now you've got a team of people that need to have continuous shared understanding. So there is a number which it could be too big, and that could become a burden to get that information shared across the team. And that's why Scrum recommends 10 or less. I've seen 11, but I can imagine, imagine having a Scrum team of 20, that would be very hard. How would you get your daily Scrums done? You see, it becomes, in, it becomes impossible. So I think small is relative, but definitely I think provided you've got all the skills, as Alex has said, on the team, I think small and nimble teams are really better than very large teams. So I would agree with that. And Ramal, do you have something else to add? I see your hands up. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm working on an article. Uh, I will share on agile.cm. Uh, actually, um, my team is was, at least, was close to 17 team members. Uh, we started with 12 people in the team, and we were still increasing. Uh, I tried to have some discussions with managers to see what was the problem and challenging her maybe to discuss if hiring more will help us be more effective. And I didn't win this, uh, <laughs> this discussion. So it took me three months to reorganize the team so that actually we have two teams working on the same, the same product. So it's sometimes hard to, to achieve, to help people understand that they need maybe to, to reduce the number of people inside the teams. But let me share with you one thing I realized is that with those two teams, the one which is close to five to six people, they are more autonom, autonomous. They are able to run some events, even themselves without my participation, even if this team is relatively new to Sprint. But as they are not numerous, they are able to adapt to adjust themselves to learn to fail and to learn again and again what, what i realized with the other team with 12 people is that sometimes the daily scrum may start but no one is speaking why mm. so it's like they are like if, if they are frozen i don't know so sometimes some people are thinking someone else will start the event or someone else will share this someone else will start this point and so on. So finally, we end up in a situation where people don't take initiative. So it's, in my own experience, what I saw is that smaller teams are more creative, collaborate more, and sometimes maybe more efficient. I do understand that in some situations we need to have many people in the team, but if you want to, to build a wonderful product, to be creative, to be to improve again and again, to be to collaborate more, maybe you should pay attention to the to the size of the team. And I know that from the Harvard Business Review, they have a number which is close to uh, four to six people in the team. So it depends, but this is the number that they, they found in their the experiments. So that was my point. Great, thank you all for sharing your perspectives on that one.
Um, so we are coming up on our time box here. There's still some questions here that we did not get to. Uh, we will definitely address those offline. Uh, so keep an eye out for those answers. If you're waiting for an answer on a question, I will share um, your questions with our panel here. And with that, I'd like to leave this with, I, for our panel, if you all want to share quickly how our audience can best get in touch with you, that would be a great way to close us off here. If you have further questions or things like that, if you want to start off, Sam? Right. So um, the best way to catch me really is on, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram and on LinkedIn. Just type in my name, Samuel Adishoga, and you'll find me on there. Fantastic. And Ramald, how to best get in touch with you? Yes, uh, I have my website, agile.cm or LinkedIn slash in slash Romuald Frank. So uh, I'm here. We also have a community on uh, on LinkedIn, which is Agile Cameroon. So website, agile.cm, LinkedIn, or the community. Fantastic. And Alex, I see you dropped some links to your LinkedIn and also oh. Agile Africa. Any other ways people get in touch with you? Yeah. So um, yeah, those are the main main ways right now to, to reach out. For LinkedIn, I'm pretty reactive. I'm almost every day on LinkedIn. And uh, uh, the community is open for free for people who want to, to learn and uh, connect with other Agilists who are wondering how to start, how to move on. So yeah, happy to connect. Fantastic. And thank you all so much um, for sharing your knowledge today with our audience. And thank you, audience, for asking some really great questions here. I hope you found this session useful. We plan on doing some more of these. So please keep a lookout on our website, um, scrum.org slash webcast is where all of our webinars are listed. And the recording of this will be available within 24 hours. So keep an eye out for that as well. And thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day and scrum on. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Lindsay. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.